And I'm just going to address this in a couple of minutes, right? The idea that Asian Americans, right? Because what has the Xinjiang narrative, what has the war on China, the propaganda war done? It's created anti-China, anti-Asian sentiment. There's not going to be a study out there probably for years and years and years showing this link, but there's a link. There's a link between the new Cold War on China and the rise in anti-Asian hatred and sentiment. And some people will say, well, these ordinary people who are committing these attacks on Asian Americans, on people of Asian descent, they don't know anything about geopolitics. Obviously, they think that people don't pay attention to the media. People don't pay attention to how across all sectors of the media, from entertainment to news, Asian Americans are portrayed the same, that even in these so-called accounts of diversity, there's still a lot of stereotyping, there's still a lot of racism, and of course, whenever China is portrayed, it's always as an enemy. Even on shows like Aquafina Nora from Queens, which I covered in, in an article, China is considered this totalitarian, authoritarian boogeyman this dark cloud hanging over the West. And that is what creates a lot of anti-Asian sentiment. And one really very, very, very insidious narrative that has crept up is that black people are the ones who are committing all of these attacks, right? It's black people who are attacking uh, uh, people of Chinese descent, people of Thai descent, people of all, you know, people all across right? Migrants, people who live in the United States for many, many, many years, right? Maybe not even migrants, many generations. But they're being attacked in the news and the corporate media says it's black people, right? There's, there's this division. And I want to I wanna just counter this, okay? Because one, I don't want to discount the fact that racism toward Asian Americans affects everyone, that people's consciousness are impacted. And it's not like when you see a black person on, on video attacking an Asian uh, elder, maybe it's not like that didn't happen, but it's taken completely out of context. Who is perpetrating the majority of these crimes and where do these crimes stem from? And I think I should do a separate stream. I've written about this, about the roots of anti-Asian racism, and we've had streams about this. But I'm just going to show you something really quickly, a study that was done recently about how these viral images really negatively affect our perception of what the problem is. Viral images show people of color as anti-Asian perpetrators, and that misses the big picture. So uh, they have long-term consequences, this perception for racial solidarity, solidarity that's existed. This is not, a, you know, just a year ago. And so... Uh, a, a professor at the American Studies at the University of Maryland released an analysis that drew on previously published studies on anti-Asian bias, and she found through official crime statistics and other studies that more than three quarters of offenders of anti-Asian hate crimes and incidents from both before and during the pandemic have been white, contrary to much of the images circulating online. And she told NBC Asian America that such dangerous misconceptions about people who perpetrate anti-Asian hate incidents can have long-term consequences for racial solidarity. The way that the media is covering and the way that the people are understanding anti-Asian hate at this moment in some ways draws attention to these long-standing anti-Asian biases in U.S. society, but the racist kind of tropes that come along with it, especially that's predominantly black people attacking Asian Americans who are elderly, that's not really an empirical basis. There's no real empirical basis in that. So there you go. I mean, I just wanted to show you one thing. I just looked it up really quick, right? We have to understand that the Western media, the corporate media is never going to show us the truth. They're going to do anything they can to take advantage of this for profit and to ensure that oppressed people are divided. They don't want Yuri Kochiyama, Malcolm X to be the, um, to be the example that we follow. They don't want, right, the solidarity of Ho Chi Minh, right, visiting Marcus Garvey, Mao Zedong, hosting Robert Williams, right? They don't want that kind of solidarity to be the thing. Or how about the black people in Detroit? I was reading this in China Daily today. Black people in Detroit collaborating, cooperating with uh, um, Asian Americans in Detroit during the 1980s killing of Vincent Chin. 
You don't want that kind of cooperation. They don't want that. And we saw this during the Black Lives Matter uprising of 2020. You had a lot of Asian Americans, especially in the colleges, students, young people coming out and saying, we are with black people on this. We do not support these killings. And so this has been a longstanding thing from the Rodney King rebellion, when you had Korean so-called right uh, business owners uh, defend, you know, all this defense of their businesses. You had it even during the 2020 rebellions as well. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you remember the Spike Lee film, right? Um, that that kind of hints at this, and it's not an unreal thing. There are tensions, right, among certain classes based on maybe a racial divisions, but a lot of this has to do with class with about small businesses, with about how uh, it can be. And I know this for a fact, right, that people who immigrate to the United States look at the United States in the way that it's been taught to them, right, as an empire that's exceptional, that's the most powerful country in the world, and that black people are always on the bottom. So that's a lot of how, for most, vast majority, if not all, migrant populations are taught to view the, the United States. Black people are on the bottom. Don't be like them. And that can create tensions, surely. That is not to be discounted. But there's also been a lot of work, right? A lot of solidarity, a lot of political work that's been done over the years to not just break through that, but to also talk about the class solidarity that people can have with each other when right? These so-called privileges start to uh, wither away. We, you know, I, when I was in Boston, this was a big conversation because African migrants were being detained like crazy. And uh, uh, Boston has one of the most divided black communities in the United States between black Americans and those who emigrated from places, uh, African countries, Cape Verde, right? Uh, just incredibly divided. And it had been economically for a long time, but thing, uh, conditions, right? I mean, in Boston, black people have about $8 to their name on average, right? Median wealth for black Bostonians is $8. For those who may be from the Caribbean or from African countries, right? Uh, at least in terms of just like uh, first, second generation, those who migrated from these countries within the last 40, 50, uh, uh, 60 years, uh, they had something like $1,200, $2,000 to their name. Not that much more, but more than $8. And so that does create divides. And then, of course, there's the propaganda and the racism, the embedded white supremacy that keeps people at each other, or at least keeps people resentful of each other, divided, maybe not going to politically work together. But a lot of that goes away when there are common struggles like police brutality, because usually police aren't discriminating, right? When it comes to immigration raids, ICE, when it comes to the violence, state repression, not discriminating. And then, of course, when it comes to neoliberal decline in economic standards, not, as, you know, there's still discrimination, but not discriminating as much as maybe before when these cleavages were more useful. So I think it's just important to recognize this and to understand anti-Asian racism, not as a byproduct of black people's resentment or, uh, you know, this tensions between anti, you know, between Asian Americans and black Americans, but it really is a byproduct of centuries of history that parallel the centuries of history of white supremacy toward black Americans. So directly paralleled that a lot of policy, a lot of U.S. imperialist policy over the past two centuries has been directly intertwined. What I mean by this is that a lot of the forced labor that came from China, from India to the United States to build things like railroads was a direct result of the tensions of slavery in the United States. That there's a lot of slave rebellions, a lot of abolitionist sentiment, and a lot of high cost when it came to enslavement in the latter years of chattel slavery. So some capitalists said, we're not going to do that. Here's another way. Let's get low wage to no wage Chinese labor, Asian labor, and let's build that way. And so that was a, that there was a direct call and response there. 
And then when it comes to the fact that the United States literally banned anyone from Asia from migrating here until 1965, right? There really wasn't, it really wasn't allowed. <laughs> the law said that people from abroad could not come here from those parts of the world. Then because of the black movement, the black left movement, that law was taken off the books along with the Civil Rights Act. So these struggles are intertwined, right? The struggle for black self-determination benefits everybody. And the fight, of course, against anti-Asian racism, which is really a byproduct of imperialism, also benefits everybody. So uh, we need to stop talking about it as if it's about some kind of race war between oppressed groups and more about how it is about maintaining imperialism and racism in the hegemony of this ruling elite that wants us to be fighting each other and doesn't want us to talk about commonalities and doesn't want to talk about what we could be doing together to address this problem.